Jesus Christ. And may I not forget the blood he shed. It is by his death I am alive. Because of Christ, I am alive. Because of Christ, I am of Christ I am So glad you're with us today. Thank you, Steve. Turn it down. That's one reason why I sound so cluttered. Thank you for being with us. Glad you're here. Um, glad to be in the house of the Lord with you today. Uh, bathrooms, restrooms are straight out that door if you need them. Um, let's take just a moment today and start with some silence just to kind of focus our hearts and minds on being here and worshiping here today. Let's do that now. Let's focus right here.
Lord, we love you and we're thankful for who you are. We're thankful for this day and just for the opportunity to be together and to worship together. Uh, we pray that in everything we do today that we would bring you honor and glory. That we would bring you, that we would come as humbly as we can to worship and that we would, um, and that we would let the gospel be the motivation of our heart. That we would let the good news of Jesus be what ties us together, brings us together today, and let that be the lens in which we see and hear and sing and do everything that we do today, Lord. Help us in that way. Well, we want to lift up our community to you today. We're very thankful, Lord, for just the gospel presence that we saw this weekend in the, in the, in the women's conference that was here and the, and the attendance of that. Lord, we're very thankful for the, the, the gospel that was proclaimed. Lord, we pray that the gospel would permeate through this community and we would see lost people get saved. But we pray that those who don't know you would come to know you. That they would come to saving faithful. We pray that. Lord, we pray that our church, Kingsville Baptist, would be known for, for seeing people come to know the gospel. That we would be known for being on mission together, Lord. But not just us, but the other churches in this area as well, Lord. We just pray that they would be on mission um, for the sake of the lost in this community. We want to pray for Serecta Church just down the road, Lord, that you would be with them as they worship this morning and you would minister to them, be with their pastor as he preaches the word, Lord. Just give them eyes and ears to hear the gospel and the good news of Jesus. And Lord, just I pray that they, when they leave their church today, that they would be on mission for you. Lord, we want to lift up those in our community that respond to the emergencies of our life, Lord, our doctors, our nurses, our first responders like our EMS and firefighters and police. Lord, we just pray you would be with them and provide for them and protect them as they work so hard to protect us, Lord. We pray for our small time, our small business owners and farmers and, Lord, those who, who literally provide for us the things that we need day to day, Lord. Provide for them what they need. And, Lord, we just want to lift up our country today and lift up the, the, the leadership of our country from our president down to our local government, Lord. We just pray you would give them the wisdom they need to lead well. We pray, Lord, for the, the unity of our country as we begin to enter into a period of, of a time of election and a time of looking at new leadership, Lord. Or, and we just pray, Lord, that you, would, that you would lead and guide that, Lord, that we can trust you in that process, that we would not put our hope in political parties, but we would put our hope in Jesus, Lord. Help us to keep our mind focused on, on Jesus in the midst of this season. Lord, we also just pray for... Um, the church in America, those, we pray that the church in America would be on mission. We pray that the church, would, the church in America would be united behind the gospel, Lord. We pray that the church would be, would stand on the good news that is found in scripture, Lord. We just pray all those things and pray that you would bless and be with the church here in America, Lord. We want to pray specifically for church planners. Lord, I want to pray today for Timothy Royal at Impact Church in Spring Creek, Nevada. Lord, I just want to lift up their church to you, their plant, Lord, that you would provide for them the things that they need. Lord, would you help them disciple those in that area, Lord, to, to know Jesus deeper. And Lord, would you just be with them in every way, Lord? Would you, would you give them what they need in order to do ministry in that community? And then, Lord, we want to pray for the world. There's conflict everywhere, Lord, um, just this week, the news of, of everything that's happening in, in Haiti, but then also we still have the, the conflict in, in the Gaza Strip, and we have Ukraine, and we have all the, the different conflicts that we see all over the world. We pray for your quick peace, and we pray for the protection of the innocent, Lord, and we pray that you would somehow take what is evil and turn it for good, um, and that this could be used in a way that would reach more people for the gospel. We pray for missionaries that are going overseas, that you would protect them and be with them and provide for them their needs. We pray for the persecuted church, those who are in danger of being um, put in jail and, or tortured or even killed. Lord, we just pray for your protection, Lord, and wisdom to be with them. And Lord, we pray for the unreached people groups, those who have never heard the name of, of, name of Jesus. We pray that they would, that you would send missionaries to them and that they might receive salvation. Lord, specifically, I want to pray for the Somalis of Scandinavia, those who we pray that they would hear the gospel, we pray they would receive salvation, and Lord, we pray that they would have ministers to reach others in their area, Lord. We pray that over them, Lord. And above all today, we want to give you honor and glory for all that you are doing in our church. And we thank you, and it's in your name that we pray. Amen. Will you join me in our responsive reading? What do we believe about the Holy Spirit? That he is God, co-eternal with the Father, and the Son that God grants him irrevocably to all who believe. 
Our scripture reading comes from John 14, 16 through 7, 17. It says this, And I will ask the Father, and he will give you another helper to be with you forever, even the Spirit of truth whom the world cannot receive because it neither sees him nor knows him. You know him, for he dwells with you and will be in you. Let's stand and get ready to sing. Sure. Yeah, we can pray for that. Yeah. Well, we love you and we're just thankful for who you are. And Lord, we just want to pray today for this very specific need in that we are seeing many injured and even dying here uh, in our own county. And Lord, we just pray, Lord, that you would be with these workers that are having to, to meet this need um, in, in, right in the face of it, Lord. We just pray you'd be with them and lead and guide them in that. We pray for these families that are being impacted by this, that you would be with them. Um, Lord, we love you and we're thankful for you. And Lord, we know that you are sovereign over all these things and we trust you in these things. And so, Lord, we just ask for your help in this area. Lord, we love you we praise you. It's in your name we pray. Amen. Amen. Let's stand and sing. Y'all join with us in the doxology. Praise God from whom all blessings flow. Praise Him, all creatures here below. Praise Him above, ye heavenly hosts. Praise Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. morning comes from Romans chapter 6 verses 5 through 11. For if we have been united with him in a death like his, we shall certainly be united with him in a resurrection like his. We know that our old self was crucified with him in order that the body of sin might be brought to nothing so that we would no longer be enslaved to sin. For one who has died has been set free from sin. Now if we have died with Christ, we believe that we will also live with him. We know that Christ being raised from the dead will never die again. Death no longer has dominion over him. For the death he died, he died to sin once for all, but the life he lives, he lives to God. So you must consider yourselves dead to sin and alive to God in Christ Jesus. gift of grace is Jesus my Redeemer. There is no more for heaven now to give. He is my joy, my righteousness and freedom. My steadfast love, my deep and boundless peace. To this I hope Yeah. 
this valley he will reign. Oh, the night has been won, and I shall overcome, yet not I, but through Christ in me. No fate I dread, I know I am forgiven. The future sure, the price is has been paid for Jesus bled and suffered for my part and he was raised to overthrow the grave and to this I hold my sin has been defeated Jesus now and ever So we got a new song for y'all this morning, and um, it's new, but it kind of pays homage to some older ones, um, Blessed Assurance, um, and a couple other ones. But the the premise of the song is is trusting in God and just having faith, and um, and sometimes it's harder to do that than others. But we serve a big God, and He doesn't always work in our time. And so the chorus goes like this: Y'all sing with me. So I trust in God, my Savior, the one who will never fail. He will never fail. I trust in God, my Savior, the one who will never Jesus is mine. He's been my fourth man in the fire time after time. Born of His Spirit, washed in His blood, and what He did for me on Calvary. Trust in God, my Savior, the one who will never fail. He will never fail. I trust in God, my Savior, the one who will never Never fail. 
perfect submission all is at rest I know the author of tomorrow is ordered my steps so this is my story and this is my Praising my risen King and Savior all the day long. So I trust in God, my Savior, the one who will never fail. He will never fail. My Savior, the one who will never fail, he will never fail. So I sought the Lord, and he heard, and he answered. I sought the Lord, and he heard, and he answered. I sought the Lord. And he heard, and he answered. That's why I trust him. That's why I trust him. I sought the Lord, and he heard, and he answered. I sought the Lord, and he heard, and he answered. I sought the Lord, and he heard, and he answered. That's why I trust him. That's why I trust in God. My Savior, the one who will never fail, he will never fail. So I trust in God, my Savior, the one who will never even when we can't give us give us give us the grace give us the strength to trust you in hard times because god you are good and everything that happens on this earth is is for our good yeah just let us take something away from the the, the message that you've given to aaron this morning god soften our hearts and our minds so that we can take it in and take it with us Amen. One of the biggest things that was helpful to me when I first came here as pastor three years ago was the pastor search team um, met with me monthly for a year um, to check in on me, to um, see how I was doing, just to talk. Um, and then also we used that time to kind of talk about um, what revitalization would look like at Kingsville Baptist. And we had some really good conversations about you know, the history of the church and about maybe what the future could look like and just really good conversations and really good accountability during that time. It was also during that time in those conversations at some point with someone, I don't remember who, but where I, where I learned that at one point in time, the, the church here had a transition team um, during, uh, after the retirement of the last pastor. And, and during that time of the transition team, there was a, a, a decision that was made that at some point when the new pastor gets here that there would be need to take a look at the, at the bylaws, the current, our, the current bylaws of the church. And so that began me to begin looking at that. And then after I'd been here a year, a full year, I kind of recommended to the deacons that there, do, that there needed to be some type of change to the bylaws. And I began to look at that and pray about that and really read a lot of books toward that and go to conferences about that. I mean, I just really focused in on, on that and what that could possibly look like. And there's two questions I kept coming back to. Um, the first question, I think the most important question, was what is biblical? 
Um, what, would, what would church structure look like biblically? Um, because I think as the spiritual leader of this church, that's, that is my job, is to make sure that we hold fast to Scripture in every area, including, including our structure. And then the second thing that I looked at was what is simplest. And I looked at what is simplest because I read a book uh, by Tom Rainier and Eric Geiger that was called Simple Church. And in the opening chapter of the book, they, they said this, uh, which has been really helpful for me. In our, exist, in our extensive research of more than 400 evangelical churches, we compared growing, ch growing and vibrant churches to non-growing and struggling churches. Church leaders from both groups completed the same survey, which was designed to measure how simple their church discipleship process was. In general, simple churches are growing and vibrant. Churches with a simple process for reaching and maturing people and expanding the kingdom. Conversely, complex churches are struggling and anemic. Churches without a process or with a complicated process for making disciples are floundering. And so when I read that and I finished reading that book, which was an extensive book. It was over 300 pages with full of research and full of practical ways to do this. And I remember thinking, coming out of that book, thinking, whatever, however I lead Kingsville Baptist Church, because I read this probably within the first six months of me being here, however I lead Kingsville Baptist Church, it needs to be biblical and it needs to be simple. And that's the way, and that's kind of the way I began to think about what bylaws would look like. And so as I, as I read those books, as I went to those conferences, as I pray and thought, and specifically as I read scripture and saw in Acts and in the New Testament, I kept coming back to a plurality of elders. I kept coming back to what that would look like. And then in November of 2022, I presented to the deacons what a, what a church structure would look like under a plurality of elders and what that would mean. Um, and then for 14 months, and I recommended that those deacons um, make a subcommittee or some, some type of committee to look at our current bylaws to transition us to a new one that would have a plurality of elders. Um, and we did that for 14 months. For 14 months, the deacons got together, there was three of them, and they went through section to section of the bylaws, looking at them and making, making the changes that we thought were necessary, bringing those back to the other deacons for us to discuss. And then in those discussions, um, there was a lot of rewriting that happened. There was even some arguments that took place um, to come to a semblance of some type of common ground. And after 14 months at the deacon retreat this January, it was decided by the deacons to move those new bylaws, those working bylaws, to the bylaws committee for them to begin doing what they do, which would be to, to make sure everything lines up as it's supposed to be and make sure every I is dotted and every T is crossed. While also, during those 14 months, I was pretty intentional to write articles about, about elder-led elder churches, about I was intentional to do Bible studies on the, on the pastoral epistles, and even did an interview with Barry Murray on, on elders and what that could look like here, and, and the deacons did a talk on deacons. And I, all that was very intentional because I don't want, I, I, when, when the new bylaws do come out of our bylaws committee and it comes before our people, I don't want anyone to be surprised what's in them. That's part of the reason why we've done this series in the sense that we've, we've kind of walked through a statement of faith to understand. I don't want you to be surprised at what may be in our statement of faith, that we have an understanding of what we believe as Baptists and what's in there. Um, and I know that there are a lot of questions and concerns because a lot of people have asked me, a lot of people have voiced them, and that's perfectly okay, and it's understandable because it's new and because it's, it's something that we don't hear a lot about, and that's perfectly all right, and I want to answer questions. But in today, and what I want to do today is I want to present a historical and biblical case for a plurality of elders and a plurality of deacons. And to do so, I want to look at Acts 6 and 1 Peter 5. So if you have your Bibles, turn to Acts 6 and 1 Peter 5. We'll be in Acts 6 first, and then we're going to end in 1 Peter 5. But while you're turning there, let's review quickly. We are, in, uh, we are ending today a series on, um, called Doctrine and Devotion, where we have looked at um, different biblical doctrines, five specifically. And last week we started the doctrine of the church, and we looked at church membership. And we said that to be a church member means to be devoted. Devoted to Christ, devoted to the Scriptures, and devoted to fellowship. And we use Acts 2, 42 through 47 to make that case. And so and today we're going to transition to leadership. If we're going to talk about leadership in the church, then we have to talk about governance or polity. Then there's three views of church leadership within Christendom, um, or especially within Protestantism. There's Episcopal, Presbyterian, and there is Congregationalness. We are only going to talk about Congregationalness because the other, if we talk about other, we'd be here all day and it'd be very boring. This is already set to be a pretty boring message as it is. 
And so I'm not going to bore you with the rest of it. Um, Congregationalists, we're going to talk about congregations because we are Baptists and Baptists are congregations. Here's a definition of what congregationalism is. Congregational polity begins with Christ as the head of the church and the priesthood of believers. This suggests that all the members should be involved in all the facets of ministry within the church. In practice, leaders such as pastors, elders, or in some settings, deacons, are elected by the congregation are delegated with the implementation of the day-to-day -day aspects of the church's ministry. Congregationalism puts the, essentially, if we want to use the word power, in the congregation's hands. That they are the ones who do the ministry of the church. This is distinctly different than other mainline denominations that would follow a Presbyterian or an Episcopal model. And the other thing that sets Baptists apart from other models is that we are autonomous, which means that we are our own entity. That is Kenningsville Baptist Church, that we own our property, that we, uh, that we own our buildings, that we own these things, that our denomination does not own them. Our denomination does not tell me what I teach, does not tell us what we sing. I do not follow a, a book of prayer. I don't do any of those things because we are our own entity. We are autonomous. And we give money to the Southern Baptist Convention. We give money to the North Carolina Baptists. We give money to the EBA. But at any point that we don't want to be a part of those, we just stop giving them money. And we're not a part of them anymore. It's that simple because we are Autonomous, and that's what sets us apart as a local church and as a congregational church. But what's interesting about, if we look at all three of those, all three of them do mention elder, pastor, overseer, and deacons because those are the two offices that we see in Scripture. If you read the Bible, especially the New Testament, you are going to see pastor, elder, overseer, and deacons. And I say pastor, elder, overseer because that's the three ways that we see that used in the New Testament and deacons. You may be sitting here, I've been in church my whole life, I've never heard of an elder. That's perfectly fine. We don't use elders a lot in this area. We use the word pastor. Pastor and elder are interchangeably. When someone says elder, they mean pastor. When someone says pastor, they mean elder. But what I think is interesting and in how we typically don't refer to it in this area, but that in the New Testament, the elder is always plural. There is always a plurality of elders. There's never just a sole elder. There's never just a senior pastor at the top. There's always a plurality of elders, meaning there is multiple ones. Now, this is interesting because this was the understanding, and this is how pretty much all Baptist churches were run historically up until about somewhere between 1925 and 1963. And even colonial America through 1925, we see that Baptists were, had this understanding of a plurality of elders. This church, Kingsville Baptist, was established in 1837, was founded with not one pastor, but with two. And, it was, and given the period of time that it was founded, it would suggest that they were following the model of a plurality of elders. Phil Newton, a, the author of Elders and Congregational Life, um, says this. May it be concluded then that every Baptist church of the past had elder plurality? Obviously not. In light, however, of Baptist historical emphasis on the autonomy of the local church, clearly Baptists noted, believe, noted and believed plurality of elders to be the New Testament model. The historical understanding of Baptists was that elders was, plurality of elders was the model of leadership in the church. That is Phil's response. But something changed between 1925 and 1963. I say those two years for this reason. In 1925, we see the Baptists put out a statement of faith, the Baptist Faith and Message 1925. And in the Baptist Faith in 1925, it does not mention pastors. It does not mention pastor. It mentions, a, it mentions elders when it talks about the leadership of the church, elders and deacons. But that changes when we get to 1963, and it doesn't mention elders anymore. It mentions pastor as single. So we have to understand that something happened between here and then. What happened? What changed? Phil Newton gives a pretty good answer. He says this the past 200 years have witnessed the demise of elder plurality among Baptists. Pastors are expected to abandon the shepherding role for that becoming ranchers, a term used often by church growth leaders. Many well-known pastors resemble corporate CEOs rather than the New Testament office of humble shepherd. Their staffs, too, have taken on the corporate structures that mirror many successful companies. Phil's answer, which I think is a good one and a right one, is this, is that at some point churches quit looking like the Bible and started looking like the business world. And they took their cues from, from corporate leadership structures, which aren't totally bad, but aren't ultimately what? Scripture. 
And so, Phil is going to continue to say, he's going to say later, he has this great quote. It's short. It's not as long as these. It's the last one I got. It says this. History merely serves to affirm the veracity of Scripture. That the Baptist understanding of how a church should be modeled comes from Scripture. That history supports the veracity of Scripture. And the model, if Scripture is our model, then where do we start? How do we understand that we see a plurality of elders and deacons? I think the clearest place you see this is in Philippians 1.1 1, 1, in Paul's greeting to the church. He greets them this way. He says, Paul and Timothy, servants of Christ Jesus, to all the saints in Christ Jesus who are at, the Phili who are at Philippi with the overseers and the deacons. He greets the church of Philippi. He says, I greet you, but I also greet the overseers and the deacons. Overseer is just another word for elder or pastor and the deacons. I'm greeting the leadership of the church and he acknowledges the leadership of the church as how? Overseers and deacons. Plural. He, notices, uh, he uh, honors them that way. We're not going to read all of these, but, but we see these referenced. 1 Timothy 3, we see qualifications for both elders and deacons. We don't see for both. In, in Romans 16, we see that Phoebe is listed as a deacon. In Acts 15, 20, and Titus 1, elders are mentioned. The model, I bring all those up to say this, that the model in the New Testament for church leadership and governance and polity seems to be, don't seem to be, it is a plurality of elders and deacons. And that they both exist. That it's not just deacons exist. It's not just elders exist. That they both exist at the same time. Well, if they both exist at the same time, then what is the difference between the two? We can answer that two ways. In qualification and in role. Their qualifications and their role. Let's start with their qualifications. Before we jump into them, let's understand this. There are a lot of different views when we start talking about qualifications of leadership in the church. Every denomination is going to have a different view of what qualifies someone to be a leader in the church. Every single one of them. And at the Baptist, because we are autonomous in our, in our churches, that's going to look different in every single church. Every single church is going to, have, is going to differ on, how they, on who can be a deacon and who can't be a deacon. Every single church is going to be different in how they see who can be an elder and who can't be an elder because of the autonomy of the local church. And so regardless of the church, denomination, or organization, they have to come to terms with 1 Timothy 3. I'm not going to read 1 Timothy 3 because of time, but in 1 Timothy 3, you have 3, 1 through 7, and 8 through 13, you see the qualification of elders and deacons. And what we see first in elders is this. In 1 Timothy 3, 1 through 7, is that if we, we were to compare both of them, we would see that they both have very similar moral qualifications. That they are almost identical in their language as far as what they are to be morally. That they are to be above reproach. And it lists all these ways that they are to be above reproach. And they are almost identical. There's, there's, it's, like they, it's like Paul copy and pasted from one thing to the other to say they're both to be morally upright, upstanding individuals. And this is what that looks like. But there is a difference. There's two small, there's two differences, two detailed differences. In 3, 1 through 7, in verse 2, we get this line that is not in the qualifications for deacons. It is able to teach. An elder must be able to teach the scriptures. An elder must be able, I would go as far as to say, to be gifted in teaching the scriptures and that they must have the ability to open the Bible and explain it in a way that people understand. That is, that is true. That has to be true of elders. That is a distinction from elders. But then we get to deacons. And in 1 Timothy 3, 8 through 13, you see deacons. But what's interesting about deacons is that what's included in deacons but not included in elders is that in verses 11 through 13, you get these three or four verses that talk about the, it's, it's either translated one of two ways. It's either translated as the deacon's wives or as women. But the word wives is the same word used for women in the Greek. So you can very easily say that, the, that, the, that we have a three or four verses there that describe deacons as women that we don't see in the elders. Now, if we were to zoom out of, out of the pastoral epistles, out of 1 Timothy 3, and we were to look at, at Romans 16, we see Phoebe as an example of a deacon in the, in the New Testament church. That she is an example of a deacon. She's listed there, Romans 16.1. Phoebe, a servant, which is the Greek word de deaconi. And so we see that she was listed as a deacon in the church. 
We do, we do not see an example of a female elder in the church at any point in the New Testament. We don't see that. And so to make this as crystal clear as I can, I would say, I would say this. Scripture describes elders as men who are morally above reproach and can teach the Bible. Scripture describes deacons as men or women who are morally above reproach. And so we see Scripture describe them this way. And if, if this view bothers you, especially when it comes to women not being able to be elders, if this view bothers you, then I, I would say this. This has nothing to do with competency or calling. The Bible isn't saying, and Paul isn't saying, that women aren't competent enough to be elders, nor that they're not called to do ministry. Because if we were to look at Romans 16, 1, and really the rest of that chapter, and even Titus 2, we see that Paul lists out um, what women, how women have ministered and, are, and can minister in the church and in the community. And we also see that he really goes through a long list in Romans 16 of praising women that have done ministry in the church. And so I think it's even safe to say that Paul gets a little bit of a bad rap of how he deals with women, especially in the pastoral epistles. But I think it can be argued from Romans 16 that no one does more for women ministry than Paul does in the local church, especially when you read Romans 16. And that's the same guy who wrote Romans 16, wrote the qualifications for elders and deacons in the pastoral epistles. Same guy. So the point is this, I think that if we, if we struggle with that, and I don't think that's saying that women aren't capable, where he's making a point of distinction in roles there. And as your pastor, I want to say this, women are essential and, indispens and indispensable to the advancement of the kingdom. And they, I want them to feel like comfortable to serve, teach, lead, and work here. And I would even say that I want them to be, I would go as far as say I would eventually want them to be on our ministerial staff. That right now we don't have a woman on ministerial staff, but I would want that eventually. And we can do that and still hold to the biblical qualifications of elders and deacons. We can still uphold women as, as faithful teachers, leaders, and servants here in the church and still hold to what the Bible says about what the qualifications of elders are and the qualifications of deacons are. We can do both at the same time. And this is how they are distinct in their qualifications. Now let's talk about how they are distinct in their roles. We have to look at Acts 6.6. 6. Acts 6.6 6 says this. 6, 1 through 6. Now in these days when the disciples were increasing in number, a, comp a complaint by the Hellenists arose against the Hebrews because their widows were being neglected in the daily distribution. And the twelve summoned the full number of the disciples and said, It is not right that we should give up preaching the word of God to serve tables. Therefore, brothers, pick out from among you seven men of good repute, full of the spirit of wisdom, and we will appoint to this duty. But we will devote ourselves to prayer and to the ministry of the word. And that they said, Please, the whole gathering. And they closed Stephen, a man full of faith in the Holy Spirit, and Philip, and Procurus, and Nicanor, and T and Timon and Paraminus and Nicholas and a proselyte of Antioch. These they set before the apostles and they prayed and laid their hands on them. The early church is just forming and it's growing at a rate that they cannot contain. It's growing so quickly. And because it's growing so quickly, we see the first problem. A complaint has come from a, from a group of Hellenists, which just means Greek, Hellenist women, and more likely these are widows, and they are not being, they're being overlooked. It's not on purpose, they're just being overlooked because it's growing so much. In order to meet this problem, the apostle says, let us elect, what, seven people to serve them, right? Seven people to serve this issue to meet this issue. Why? Why not them do it? Because why? Because there seems to be a distinction made that they are to do what? To pray and to preach that the apostles are going to pray and to preach and that, the, and that these seven chosen to serve are going to serve the physical needs of these that are being overlooked. This is what they're going to do. And so we see from first and foremost that we see this distinction is being made from apostles that they are going to pray and preach and that these seven church are going to serve the physical needs of these people. Now, these apostles are eventually going to become elders. In fact, we're going to see, we're going to read Peter in just a second, 1 Peter 5, and he's going to identify himself as a fellow elder, not as an apostle, but as an elder. And that these seven chosen to serve are eventually going to turn into deacons. It's what this is the first time we see this. And the distinction made in Acts 6, 1 through 6, is that elders, or what will be elders, 
we, they serve the spiritual needs of the body of believers. They pray and they preach. And that deacons serve the physical needs of the congregation or the community. That they take care of, the, of, of, of feeding them and taking, just making sure they have what they need. The physical needs. And that brings us to 1 Peter 5, 1 through 4, that really teases out what it looks like to be an elder in the local church. 1 Peter 5, 1 through 4. So I exhort the elders among you as a fellow elder and a witness of the sufferings of Christ as well as a partaker in the glory that is going to be revealed. Let's stop there. If we were to look at this whole letter, it was, it's almost as if Peter writes this and that he, he writes the first four chapters to one group, to the, to the congregation that he's writing to, and then he stops in five, and now I'm going to write to the leadership of this church. Because we see at the beginning of, the, of this letter that he, he greets them the same way he greets everyone. And, and, and in verse 1, Peter, an apostle of Jesus Christ, to those who are late exiles in the dispersions in Pontus, Galatia, Cappadocia, Asia, and Bithynia. And so he, he says, hey, Peter, the apostle, I'm greeting you. And he greets all these people in all these different places. But here in 5, he starts by saying what? I exhort the elders. I'm going to command the elders among you as a what? Fellow elder. He says, I am going to give you a command. I'm going to give you a command as a fellow elder and a what? And a witness of the sufferings of Christ as well as a partaker in the glory that is going to be revealed. He, he greets them in three different ways. One, as a fellow elder, he wants them to be able to relate to him because he is what they are, right? He's addressing the leadership and says, you're an elder, I'm an elder. But he also wants to root himself in, in, in someone of, who has an authority that they don't have. Because why? He was there when Christ was suffering. He was there with Christ. He was a part of the original 12. He still is an apostle. Right? He's rooting himself in that, but he's also rooting his identity in the glory that is coming. That they also have this in common, that they are waiting for a glory that is to come. He kind of roots himself in this identity of, of his past, present, and future. Past is the, uh, that he watched Christ suffer, that he was with Jesus, present, and that he is both an elder and an apostle. And then future of the glory that is coming. He is making a case here that he is saying this. I'm fixing to tell you something. I'm fixing to command you to do something, and I can do that because of this is who I am. Because I am a fellow elder, because I am an apostle, because I am waiting for the same glory you're waiting for. I am with you in this, and so because I'm with you in this, and even further along than you in this, I can say what I'm fixing to say. And this is what he says in 2. Shepherd the flock of God that is among you, exercising oversight, not under compulsion, but willingly, as God would have you, not for shame, shameful gain, but eagerly. He says this. He starts by saying, shepherding the flock that is among you. This should immediately call us back to John 21. What do we see in John 21? The resurrected Jesus is on the beach, and he's cooking breakfast. Jesus sees him. He's, not Jesus. Peter sees him, and he's excited, and he runs over to him. And what does Jesus say to Peter? He asks him, he asks him the same question three times. Peter, do you love me? Peter, do you love me? Peter, do you love me? And Peter, every time, is, it, it, it says, of course I love you. Of course I love you. Of course I love you. And how does Jesus respond to that every single time? Feed my sheep. Feed my sheep. Feed my sheep. Here, Peter is, is, is instructing the next set of elders to do what Jesus instructed him to do. Feed my sheep. Shepherd the flock that is among you. And then he tells them how, he is to, how they are to do it exercising oversight. That an elder is someone who leads. This exercising oversight in the Greek also means to look upon and to care for. That, the, that a shepherd cares for them. We talked about this a couple of weeks ago when we saw Jesus as the good shepherd. What did Jesus as the good shepherd? How did he care for the sheep? He protected them, didn't he? He made sure to protect them against predators. He led them to food. He led them to water. That is what a shepherd does. He cares for the sheep. And then ultimately, the good shepherd did what? Laid down his life for the sheep. That the elder must be willing to sacrifice his wants and needs for the sake of the people. That is what a shepherd does. He sacrifices his life for the sheep. And that's the call here in 1 Peter 5. 
And notice that not only does it tell them that they're to exercise oversight, but they're then to do what? They're, he tells them how they're to do it. Not under compulsion, but what? Willingly. As God would have you. Not for shameful gain, but eagerly. An elder must be called to be an elder. They must be willing to be an elder. This isn't something they should be taught into. This is something that they feel called upon their life as, as it says, as God would have you. And they also shouldn't do this for something that they can gain from it. They shouldn't do this as some type of power that they will receive. This isn't why it's there. Not for shameful gain, but what? Eagerly. He continues in three with how they should do it. Not domineering over those in your charge, but being examples to the flock. Elders are not bosses. They are leaders. They do, not, they do not command from a high tower and expect people just to do what they say. They lead by example. They lead in the way that they're to go. That's a difference. And I think it's a very important clarification that they are to be examples to the flock. Examples of what? Look at verse 4. And when the chief shepherd appears, you will receive an unfading crown of glory. Ultimately, the elder who is the shepherd of the flock points to the better shepherd who is Jesus. But they are not the chief shepherd. I may be the elder here, the sole elder here, but I'm not the leader of this church. I'm not the head of this church. Christ is the head of this church. And it's my job not for you to point to me, but to point to Jesus. That Christ is the head of the church. And then what we see here is that the elder does this. They were able to do this well. That what's waiting for them? An unfading crown of glory. There is reward for the elder in heaven with eternity in mind. And I think this is why he puts this there. Because this isn't easy. Because this is hard and it's difficult. And not everybody should want to do this. It's a calling. And, it's, and the suffering and the sacrifice that it takes has to be remembered that it is momentary and that there's a crown waiting for those who can do it. And so there's a, there's a, there's a weight that is there. The Bible, and especially the New Testament, is clear that both the plurality of elders and deacons are necessary in the church. These passages show that, that deacons serve the physical needs of the church and elders serve the spiritual ones. Acts 6, 1 through 6, I think makes that very clear. That apostles, the apostles that eventually become elders, do what? That they preach and they pray. That they take care of the physical, the, the spiritual needs of the church. That they pray and they preach. And that the deacons, that they take care of the physical needs. They serve tables. They serve tables. And if we are to look like scripture, then we are meant to have both a plurality of deacons and a plurality of elders. Deacons serve the physical needs of the church and the community. Elders serve the spiritual needs of the church and the community. I think the main takeaway here is this, is that both elders and deacons serve. Both elders and deacons serve. Deacons serve the physical needs and that they help. I think this isn't vague for a reason because they help in a myriad of different ways. Deacons are, meant, deacons are meant to make sure that people have food. Deacons are meant to make sure if someone needs help in their home, that they have help in their home. They're meant to, if they, if they need help moving, they, they, they move them. They just care for the people in the church that is to uplift them in a way that helps them. And elders are meant to take care of them spiritually. They are to pray. They are to pray for the needs of the people. They are to pray for the church. They are to pray for the lost. It's in James where we see what? They're to call upon the elders of the church to lift hand, to put hands on them so, so that they, because the prayer of a righteous man brings healing. And then they are to teach. I, an elder must be willing and must teach and must spend time to make sure that they teach well. They must have that gifting. And they also must be, they must be counselors. They must be willing to sit down and have hard conversations with people, wrestle with people, must be, wrestle with their doubts, wrestle with their questions. They must be willing to do those things. And when these things overlap, when the physical needs and the spiritual needs overlap, then elders and deacons are meant to work together. Because how often does that happen? It happens all the time, doesn't it? It happens all the time that our physical needs overlap with our spiritual needs. When someone who is struggling to make ends meet, they have a physical need, but they also have a spiritual need in that they're wondering where God's at in the midst of their poverty. When someone who is struggling with grief and lost someone, they have a spiritual need, but they also have someone, they need someone to probably, you know, make them dinner that night. 
That's a physical need that needs to be met, but there's also a spiritual need that needs to be a part of it. And I think there's this understanding that, there's, that, that this is a hierarchy. It's not a hierarchy. It's not elders, deacons, committees, members. That's not what it is. It's elders and deacons and members walking side by side doing ministry together for the sake of the church and the community. It's not a hierarchy. It's the two working together because the two can't do this without one another. There's, this, there's clear and distinct functions, are both, and both are needed because we, some people are better at this than others. Some people are better at meeting physical needs than other people are. And some people are better at doing spiritual things than other people are. And that's okay. Because why? We're all different parts of the body. And we all have different giftings and we need one another. And so we have to fit in different places. And so some people are, are, better, are better fit to be elders and some people are better fit to be deacons. And some people are better fit not to be at all and to be in other places in the church. And that's okay. Not one person is better than the other. Not one person is better than the other. The elder is not better than the deacon. The deacon is not better than the elder. And the properties chair is not better than any of them or lesser than any of them. They all need one another. The church is meant to function together for the ministry of the church. It's not a hierarchy. And a healthy and thriving church leadership serves. And they serve the church and they serve the community. I think ultimately when we hear this, I think, I think oftentimes because we have such a bad view of membership, we have such a bad, a bad view of, of church doctrine that we think that serving means that we get what we want. That's not what, that's not what it means to serve. That's not what it means for the elder to serve or the deacon to serve. By the elder serving and the deacon serving the local church, it means that they point people to Jesus. Because here's at the end of the day. As your sole elder, I will fail you. I will let you down. I will make a mistake. I will say something I shouldn't say. I will be, I will be quick-tongued, and I will push too hard at times. Because I'm a person, and I'm a sinner. And any deacon in here would say the same thing about themselves. Because why? We're people, and we're going to fail. We're not perfect. We do not live up to the qualifications that we see in 1 Timothy 3. No one does. But that's not the point of being an elder and a deacon. The point of being an elder and a deacon is to point people to Jesus, the one person who is the perfect servant and the perfect shepherd and who does not sin and who did not fail. That is why we're here. We're to point people to that. That is what it looks like to serve. It's to point people to Jesus. And also it looks to serve to, 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 to embody the Great Commission. Elders and deacons should embody what it means to be on mission for the Lord. They should embody that. They should live that out. And if they're not, they should be held accountable to that. The elders and deacons in the church should be looked at as ones that are already doing that, not ones that have to be spurred on to do it. That is what it means to be an elder and deacon. That's what it means to serve the church, is to point them to Jesus and to spur them on to the Great Commission. I'll conclude this way. Nowhere, nowhere in the Bible is this commanded. Nowhere. There's nowhere that it says you must have a plurality of elders, you must have a plurality of deacons. But it is the only model that is there. There is no other model. There is no other model in Scripture for church governance than a plurality of elders and a plurality of deacons. There is no other qualifications for elders or deacons than what we see in 1 Timothy 3 and in Titus 1. No other ones. It's what we got. It's what we got to go with. And so what I would say is this. Let us be faithful to Scripture. And let us trust that God is good and that he knew what he was doing when he wrote the book. Let's pray. Lord, we love you and we're thankful for who you are. We're thankful for your word. We pray, Lord, that you would help us as we begin this journey of looking at what it would mean to be led by a plurality of elders and what it would mean to be led by a plurality of deacons and what that would look like at, here at Kingsville Baptist Church. Let us do this with grace and mercy for one another. pray ultimately for our deacons that are already existing, that are already here and already leading in such a great way. Would you continue to spur them on to embody the Great Commission? Would you continue to spur them on to, to point people to Jesus, to point our congregation to Jesus? Lord, we need your help in that. I need your help as the, as the lone elder here, Lord. I need your help to do that. Lord, we love you and we're thankful for you. And it's in your name that we pray.
Amen. Let's stand and sing. Just as I am without one plea, but that thy blood was shed for me, and that thou bidst me come to thee, O Lamb of God, I come, I come. Just as I am and waiting not to rid my soul of Thank you for that we get to come to you just as we are. God, not only that we get to come to you, but that you walk beside us just as we are every day. Um, God, walk with us this week as we wrestle with you know, whatever it is we have going on. Um, and just help us to be faithful to you. And we pray. Amen. Quickly, just a few announcements. Um, tonight we have... Um, KBC Youth at 5 o'clock, and then Wednesday we have Lunch and Learn at noon, and then KBC Women at 6.30. Next weekend we have a big weekend in that we have the Easter Palooza Saturday from 11 to 2. Um, bring your kids out for that. It's going to be a big event we're really excited about. Pray for no rain. Pray for no rain. Um, we'll be sending an email out about this this week for those who are volunteering to give you more information about that. And then next um, Sunday we have a baptism and people joining the church. And so we're really excited about that. If you're interested in baptism, interested in membership, please talk to me before Sunday. We'd love to, we'd love to dunk you, and we'd love for you to join our family. All right, KBC, go and make. <laughs>